I joined the Confederate Army the same day that Nathan Bedford Forrest joined. I had traveled a hundred miles to get to Memphis on my best horse, and Forrest was in line right in front of me. We talked as the line got closer to the table where we signed our names and our lives away. I could see that Forrest was a rich man by the way he was dressed. All of us were farm boys and we looked like it, and here was a rich horse trader in the same line as us. He would enlist as a private just like me. I instantly liked the man. In our conversation, he asked if I could ride a horse and I told him that I could. He told me to stay close to him because he was about to raise a whole cavalry corps, but that the army did not know that yet. I didn't know a soul in this place, so I bet my war fortunes on private Forrest. After signing the line, I rode with Forrest back to his beautiful home, and he invited me and several other boys to stay. Within a week, there were 50 of us living in and about his property. Poor Mrs. Forrest did her best to feed us all, but she could not keep up, so we all pitched in with the cooking and cleaning chores. We did minor repairs to the forest home in our idle time. We were much obliged to have a place to stay and be so well fed. Another week passed and the day came that Forrest told us to mount up and go with him. It was time to train for the war. When we got to the camp at the outskirts of Memphis, there were at least four to five hundred men along with horses and all the supplies we would need for a month. I don't know how he did it, but Forrest had raised and outfitted a whole cavalry unit. We began our training, learning how to take orders and do exactly as we were told, when we were told. Now I had spent most of my life on the farm tending to our horses, and I knew them well. I learned more about horses that month, though. The most unique to me was that horses could be turned into war horses and ride into the most violent situations. If I spurred my ride, she would ride straight into hell with me. We also learned to shoot from a horse while it is at a full out run, a handy skill for a cavalryman, although we never used that skill. We left training and were outfitted war fighters. We were ready for a fight. There were several skirmishes and full out assaults we made in Tennessee and in Arkansas. During the winter of 1862, News was circulating that the Union forces were coming into Tennessee from Kentucky by boat on the Tennessee River, so we headed to the Tennessee-Kentucky state line in support of a larger army. By this time, Forrest had been made a colonel. The man was moving up in rank so fast we were surprised, but we knew we had the best chance with him, so we were happy to see the man attain more rank. We fought those Yanks for two days at Fort Donelson. The weather was horrible and cold. Snow felt on us, making the battle even harder for both sides. Some of those poor Yanks slept out in those snow-covered fields without proper clothing, and many died from frost. Our boys in the forts had it a bit better, but the Yanks ended up whipping us anyway, causing the fort to surrender. Forrest would not have it, though, and we were able to escape on our mounts and avoid the prison camps up north. Forrest told the commander we could make a way for those boys to get out, but they preferred surrender. General Forrest hated those officers after that. He was not one to ever give up anything, and we loved him for it. We might die fighting, but we would not starve to death in a Yankee prison camp. Forrest Calvary headed back into Tennessee and down into Mississippi, close to my home. But it wasn't long before we were on the Tennessee River again, fighting the same damn Yankees that whipped us at Fort Donelson. The order was to move from Corinth and head north until we engaged the enemy. We met them at a place called Shiloh. It was a horrible fight. I had known the quickening of battle and how it affects a man. This was much worse. Many men were lost in those three days. I had a horse shot out from under me the first day, which made me walking infantry until I found another mount. On the second day of the battle, I took a mini ball to my left arm while we were covering our retreat. There were not many who made it out if they were wounded, but I was one of the few who could make the walk back to Corinth on our retreat. I was sent home to recover. I could have stayed out of the war with that wound, 
and I did for almost two years. And then I got word that General Forrest Calvary had been seen patrolling the woods around our home place. I stopped some of those boys to find out what the order of business was, and they informed me that General Forrest Calvary had been ordered to destroy everything he could find with the Union flag flying over it. It was May, and the weather had been hot that spring. My father had plenty of help on the farm, so I rode out to find General Forrest Riders to join them. I knew there would be a fight soon because we had seen those Yankee scouts trying to move around in the thick woods in our area. I found a group of boys camp late that night, and I was back in General Forrest's outfit by morning. The Union General Sturgis had been ordered to leave Memphis to find us and engage us wherever he found us. Those Union boys knew Forrest's men were roaming around that country and they were hell-bent on a fight, and we were about to give them one. We met the Yanks at a place called Bryce's Crossroads, an area that I knew well, having traveled through there on my way to Ripley and Holly Springs. The Yanks were funneled into a narrow road with impassable woods on each side. The first blue uniforms we saw appear on that narrow road at the Bryce place got the surprise of their lives when we opened up on them. This made those boys in the rear have to double time it to the fight, and by the time they got there, they were so tired they had little energy left. But they did put up one hell of a defense as we attacked them all day long. Eventually, the force was pushed back down the road in full retreat, and we followed them, killing as many Yanks as we could. There was a deep creek where the Yanks had left a small unit to cover their retreat at a bridge over this creek. My unit was ordered to hit their left flank and assist an infantry unit of our boys who were in rapid pursuit. To get to that open left flank, we had to travel on our mounts through thick brush and timber. We pushed our horses as hard as we could to get there and start the attack. We were ahead of the infantry, but we wanted those Yanks thinking about us when the infantry hit the bridge head on. After the longest time, we finally saw the creek bottom, and we paralleled it until we could see some Yank defenses. Just before we got into firing range, we dismounted and took up positions on their left, and we opened fire. There were about 50 of us. The Yanks had anticipated the maneuver and were waiting on us. Two cannons opened up on us immediately, and a canister exploded against a tree I was using to steady my rifle. I felt severe pain to my right arm and both legs. As I slipped into blackness, I figured I was about to meet my maker. In my cloudy vision from the ground, I saw horses rearing wide-eyed and men shouting. Those Yanks just kept up their fire into our area, but we fought back. Men yelled at each other and smoke eventually obscured my view. I could not hold my eyes open any longer and I slipped off into death's arms. When I awoke, it was dark. I could distinctly hear the night insects making their nocturnal chants. After a minute, there was enough light that I could see two men horribly disfigured laying within arm's reach of me. I was alive for the moment, and I felt for the boy strewn around me. There was the unmistakable sound of a horse nearby stepping through leaves and blowing. I tried to move, but it was too painful. I was so thirsty, and I would have given my soul for a cool drink of water. The silence around me was odd, because what seemed like just minutes ago, a war was thundering through those woods. I relaxed in the silence. Moving my right arm a little, I found that it was usable and reached to my legs to feel around. My trousers were tattered and wet. I assumed it was blood. I felt the other leg and it was the same. I laid back and wondered if anyone would find me. I would soon realize that I was on my own. I felt tired again and I was fighting the sleep that was about to again overtake me when I heard footsteps, heavy footsteps. I rolled my head over to see who would be my rescuer, and I saw two tree trunk thick legs standing next to me. I was so weak that it did not matter to me. Maybe I was hallucinating. Then the figure bent down as if to look at me. I heard a low, guttural noise, a purr, if you will. It was not human. I still fought the sleep off with all my might. It was overtaking me again. 
Then there were two of the furry figures standing at my feet. They were communicating in some language that I did not understand. The largest of the two leaned over again and wrapped its huge hand around my right leg and pulled. I resounded with a scream. The pain was too much to bear. The second beast took my other leg and they began to drag me away from the tree and through the leaves and the green undergrowth. They dragged me over one of my mates and I felt his stiff, lifeless body roll under me. The pain was getting worse and I began to scream at them, but they just kept walking. Then they let go. One dropped out of view in front of me and I lifted my head to see what was next. Another hand around my shin, and I was being dragged over the bank into a deep creek. I felt myself lifted into the air and then slung over a shoulder of the beast, and then I lost consciousness again. When I awoke, I was in darkness. It was cold. I did not remember it being cold. We had been beaten by heat all day and night, but now I was cool. I blinked my eyes and waited for them to adjust to the darkness. I noticed a small flicker of light in the distance. The light grew brighter, and I could see a fire had been made. I had been rescued, and I was in the hands of my countrymen. A sigh of relief exited my chest. I began to feel my legs again, and the trousers that had been wet were now dry. My bleeding had stopped. I could move my arms, but not my legs. Then a figure began to move towards me with a torch in their hand. My horror returned when I saw that it was one of the creatures that had dragged me from the battlefield. I had hoped I had been dreaming. All hope that had filled my soul suddenly went to despair. But I could not fight. I had no weapon, and I was at the mercy of a group of monsters. I laid my head back into the pile of leaves and closed my eyes. Later, I felt one of them tearing the clothes away from my legs. I did not fight. I couldn't. Once they had the trouser legs away and my legs were bare, they started thumping on my boots and grunting at me. The impact to my boots caused me pain and I said, no. The female who had been so adamant backed up a little and then started that purr again. It was a low rattle from her diaphragm. Then she ran her coarse hand gently over my boot. She wanted them off me, but there was no way I could do that, and I fear that they had no idea what a boot was, so we had to compromise and leave them on. Then she leaned down and inspected my legs, running her huge hands flat over my skin. She then removed a large blob of chewed up vegetation from her mouth, and she began to pack my wounds. The pain was minor, so I allowed her to complete her task. She then covered my legs with a blanket, a saddle blanket they had obviously removed from one of the dead horses on the battlefield. They were nursing me back to health. I did not know what to do with this realization. I drifted back off into a deep sleep. Once again waking and not knowing the amount of time that had passed, I looked again at my surroundings. It was still dark and I felt like it should be daylight. My internal clock was usually right, but it was dark and the only light was from a smoldering fire across the way. I looked up and could see reflections of the light dancing off of something hanging. I was in an enclosed area. It had a roof and something was hanging from the ceiling. As my eyes focused, I could see that these hanging items were roots. The ceiling was dirt and the roof was shored with massive logs and branches. I was under the earth. That is why I was so cool. A large male walked over to me and looked at my legs and grunted. He then walked, stooped over because the ceiling was low for him, over to a wall where an animal was hanging, and he used his fingernails to claw off a slab of meat and brought it to me. I grabbed it out of his hand and began to consume the raw meat. I did not know how hungry I was until I smelled that flesh. Then I motioned for him to bring me water, and he knew exactly what I wanted. He returned with a bladder full of water and poured it into my mouth. I drank until I was sick, and I was regurgitating the meat I had just eaten. He held his hand in front of me as if to tell me to take my time. I nodded and began to drink in smaller sips. 
I then finished the slab of flesh and laid back on my bed of leaves and pulled my blanket to my chin and went back to sleep. The days passed and this routine of nursing my wounds and them feeding me continued. I do not know how many days because I felt as though sometimes I would sleep through entire days. Often I would see the young ones in the firelight dancing and playing, but the adults would never allow them close to me, even though they appeared to be very curious. Finally, one of the young came to me while the adults conversed in a strange language. When he approached me, he was smiling. I did not know these things could smile. I would never see that expression again, but it seemed to lift my spirits. He set a piece of wood beside my hip, reached over, and he touched my hair. He wanted to feel my hair. And then he scampered back to his place in the room. That was my only experience with a youngster. I estimated I had laid in this spot for two weeks. Every day, my legs seemed to be a little bit better. The only time I ever moved in either direction was when an adult would lay a woven pad of vines and leaves beside me so that when nature called, I could deposit it into the pouch. Regarding my relief of liquid, I would simply roll to my side and relieve myself. The odor in my end of the cave was beginning to be unbearable. Then one of the females walked over with both hands full of white powder to spread over the area in which I had urinated. They knew the use of lime. One day or night, I had lost track of time. I felt like trying my legs, so I motioned to one of the beasts to come over, which they did, and I grabbed his huge arm and tried to lift myself. He knew what I was trying to do, so he slid his hand behind my back and lifted me gently to a standing position, and he held me steady. I could stand. My legs were not useless. I took the opportunity to inspect my wounds in the low orange glow put off by the distant fire and could see that the wounds were extensive, but no bones had been broken. I tried to take a step and the beast grunted, telling me to lie back down. The next day I took a few steps and the day after that I was walking around the cave on my own, but still using the roots above to steady myself. It was not long before I could walk on my own. I motioned to the group of three who were now in the cave with me that I needed to go. They conversed in their gibberish for a short time, and the big male left the cave. I could not see where he had exited. They ignored me the rest of the day. Later, the male returned. He walked to me and pulled me up with his hand and pointed to the other side of the cave. I began to walk beside him, and when we rounded the corner, I could see daylight. He reached his massive arms out through the tangled limbs and brush and pulled them aside for me. I walked into the first daylight I had seen in weeks. Below me was the creek, stagnant with old water, so I had to either crawl straight up or jump into the water. I was about to jump when the male behind me grabbed my shirt, put his giant hands around my waist and lifted me straight up. I suddenly felt another set of hands slip under my arms and lift me to the ground above. I turned to look at the woods behind me and saw four more of these creatures, all males except one, the big female who had dragged me from the battlefield. She walked to me in the huge strides they make and put her massive hand on top of my head. Then with her other hand, she handed me my hat, which I had not seen since the Yanks sent cannon fire into our ranks. She began to turn around and I stopped her. I held on to her hand for a minute and looked into her black eyes, and I said, thank you. She did not respond, but I have a sense that she knows I was showing gratitude. Then the beasts parted and gave me a lane to walk into the woods. One pointed straight ahead, so I started walking. I looked back after a few steps, and they were gone, except one of the beasts' heads I saw go down below the edge of the bank. As I walked away, I heard a loud howl from the direction I had come. I looked back again, and the whole clan was moving away from the shelter and into the woods. They were leaving. After several hours, I made it back to the main battlefield. Crews were there removing the dead from the field. There were hundreds still laying in the hot sun, bloated and stinking. The small crew worked constantly, and they never acknowledged my presence. 
I made it to the area where the graves were being dug and spoke with an officer who was overseeing the grave digging. I asked him who had won the battle. He laughed at me and said, Well, we did, boy. General Forrest chased that SOB Burgess all the way back to Memphis. I asked if he had a horse I could take. He looked at my wounds and then said, Let's get you into some decent clothes before that, boy. I had time to bathe and change into some appropriate clothes. Then the lieutenant had one of his men bring me a horse, which was saddled and ready to ride. Where's your weapon, he asked. I lost it when I was wounded, I said. Boy, you were fighting in here, he asked with a dumb look on his face. I did fight here, sir. The battle was three weeks ago, boy. Where have you been? I thought for a minute and then told him that a local family had taken me in the day I fell and had nursed me back to health. He looked at me like he did not believe a word I said, but handed me the reins anyway. He told me that I would do well to catch up with Forrest's cavalry and that they had headed south, maybe to Holly Springs. I nodded and then mounted the horse and rode in the opposite direction. I rode to my home only 50 miles to the east. I finished my recovery under my family's care and finally went back to work on the farm. I never sought to find my unit again, and I never fought another day in that horrible war. Eventually, we lost, and the president pardoned all of us who fought for the Confederate side. Things never got back to the way they were before the war. In the end, they still ruled over us with an iron fist. We were invaded by hordes of Yankee soldiers and profiteers, but we had lost, and that is the course of events for a defeated nation. But somehow my family made it through that and the reconstruction area. I am an old man now. Last year I rode back to the battlefield and into the woods where I made my last stand. I saw war equipment still laying in the leaves and mud, rusting all these years later. It brought back unpleasant memories. Then I rode further into the woods to the monster's den. It was gone and the bank I had been lifted from was now washed out. I stood there for an hour hoping to see the beasts again, but there was only silence. As I mounted my horse to leave, I looked back one last time at the woods where the monsters had lived and I wondered what had happened to them. As I rode away, I was filled with gratitude in the way they had cared for me. And then I heard a long and very loud howl come from across the creek. I never looked back. I kept riding and I remembered.